continue uh, chapter 2, but we'll revise the, the motive for studying Hebrews as we have in this handout. And we'll revise also chapter 1 quickly because it's not difficult to cover. St. Paul Epistle to the Hebrews gives us um, a model or a way to understand the Old Testament because we have the master of the Old Testament as a Pharisee not only in understanding but St. Paul as a master in practicing the Old Testament as well So he's, uh, because he enforces the people to do it and the reason that he ch tells us this is that he was killing the Christians because they were challenging the Law and the Prophets by the way if you want to note their Old Testament means Law and Prophets and Psalms Law and Prophets and Psalms, better than the word old. In fact, what's intended, source the scriptures, the Law and the Prophets, they testify of me. I, uh, I, I think in maturity, it's better to use the term Law and the Prophets. Um, and the Law includes the Torah, of course, which is the first five books of Moses. So, how we understand it is in Christ, and Christ is the solution to what the Old Testament is trying to solve and cannot solve because the, the human nature is corrupted so God is uh, giving a way for the people to preserve the commandment and to observe um, the holiness but the worship of the Old Testament although it's, it's mandated by God Saint Paul will remove it because that's what Christ intended is to the way we worship God in the Old Testament is going to be replaced by a completely different way and the best chapters of this you will see it in Hebrews 5 and Hebrews 7 because he will talk about the priesthood so we'll get there second point it shows that Christ had full credible accounts testifying for him there's no other prophet or a savior or a claimed prophet in in other religions that has writ things written about him before he came none and not with that none none like zero there's nothing and the, with christ the tremendous amount of prophecies and the tremendous account of uh, of words and actions and persons and worship the worship itself if was we did leviticus a while ago here and how the worship, the sacrifices, point to God. So what points to God? Prophecies in the form of sentences. Location of cities or locations of places. Events. Persons like Joseph, Moses. All of these are David. All of these are symbols of Christ from different aspects. So prophecies, names of places, names of persons, events that happened are all constituting prophecies. So prophecies are not only sentences or verses. It could be full events or full people. For example, Joseph started reigning over Egypt when he was 30. And Christ started his mission when he was 30. Joseph saved the world from hunger. Christ saved the world from spiritual hunger or spiritual perishing. And there's a nice comparison between Joseph being called by his father and Christ being sent by the father in Genesis 37 when Jacob is sending Joseph to look for his brethren. And his brethren represent the Pharisees who, when they saw him from a distance, they wanted to kill him. So um, amazing. There's about 11 points. I did it a while ago with uh, junior high here on uh, Fridays to understand when they are young before they, their lives get complicated. Uh, doing Genesis and Exodus in type of details for them to have the foundation for the Old Testament. Third point, show us the shadow of real things. Uh, we need to understand the shadow so that when the real comes, we know that the real matches the shadow exactly. Nothing else can fit there. So the New Testament worship or account is not invented out of nowhere. This is not the beginning of things. The beginning of things is the creation and the details of fixing the creation after man damaged himself are in the Old Testament, but it doesn't fix anything. But it's a shadow. And the shadow is needed to recognize the real. When you look at the person, when you have the shadow matching exactly the person, you know that there is no other 
correspondence or this man or woman doesn't correspond to anything else or this shadow doesn't correspond to anything else except this man or woman then you know the person for really don't need to look at the shadow anymore do we ignore the old testament no the church was built on the old testament if christ is understood through the old testament which is exactly what the disciples did so the shadow is important because it was sufficient to support christ but the shadow will be replaced its worship will be replaced by the new testament so we needed the shadow because the church uh, in Christ understood the shadow in terms of the commandments and the prophecies but in terms of the practice of the law it got replaced of course it created problems in the original church uh, this is not covered in Hebrews but it's covered more in Galatians and Romans and in chapter 15 of the book of Acts so we need the shadow Christ came out fulfilling that shadow and the church used that shadow in Christ to do the sermons on the liturgies, to, to explain to people. You can see the sermons of, of St. Stephen, the sermons of St. Paul in chapter uh, 13 of Acts uh, are all about fulfilling the, the, New, the Old Testament. He's explaining to them the Old Testament and says it might, must point to Christ. So the real is the New Testament, and I focus that the real worship comes first and then the account of Christ can come later. So the Gospels were written after the church started practicing. And the reason is that when the, when the, when the apostles write the New Testament or the epistles, it's, it's already the church is practicing the faith, practicing communion, practicing laying of the hands, which is replaced, replaced by the Mayron later to give the Holy Spirit, practicing the baptism, practicing all of the sacraments already. So when the, when, the, when the Holy Spirit guides the church to write the New Testament, it doesn't write the detail. He doesn't write the detail. He writes enough account to support what the church does. A prime example of this, if you want to open Acts 13, I'll just give you a sample of it. Ordination of bishops. Where do we get that or bishops are ordained by the laying of the hands of other bishops? We find it in, in, a, in a practice in Acts 13. Um, to show that St. Paul, for him to be eligible to lay the hands and give the Holy Spirit, he has to be a bishop. But St. Paul in Acts 9, his conversion, he was just a Christian. So, and in Acts 19, he lays the hand of, on, on believers after he baptizes them to give them the Holy Spirit. But nobody can give the Holy Spirit by the laying of hand except bishops or apostles. So when did St. Paul get ordained a bishop? In Acts 13, if we read it, doesn't have a liturgy, it doesn't have details of the words, doesn't have anything, because it's being practiced already, but it has reference to it. Now in the church that was at Antioch, Antioch in Syria, there's another Antioch in Pisidia, or Pisidia, there was a certain, there were certain prophets and teachers, these are bishops existing there already, we'll see why they are bishops. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius, of Cyrene, Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Two, as they were ministering to the Lord and fasting. That's a liturgy. Ministering here in Greek is liturgonton, which is the word for liturgy. And fasting. So when somebody says, why do we fast during liturgy? Liturgies are practiced while fasting. In the middle of that liturgy, as they were liturging to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit spoke and said, Separate to me, the Holy Spirit, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. The Holy Spirit is calling two people now to work. The next verse is the punchline. Then, having fasted and prayed, whether it's the same liturgy or a later liturgy, had laid hands on them they sent them away they got ordained saint paul or saint saul and barnabas why is that important because saint paul will see him in acts 19 laying the hands on people to give them the holy spirit laying the hands on people to give them the holy spirit so this is a sample 
of something we practice, you will not find text for it, but because the church is practicing it already. That is why the, I want you to take this note important, that the, 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 the worship in the Old Testament is so detailed and repetitive, while the worship verses in the New Testament are so concise. Like, for example, Acts 13, 1 to 3, ordaining bishops. Because the New Testament will be written while already it's being practiced. The Old Testament, they had to give them the detail before the practicing. That's the law by Moses. To support this, just go to Acts 19. Let's read this um, sample, laying the hands. From verse 1 to uh, 7. And it happened while Apollos what was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they, it means they believe in Jesus Christ. And he's asking them, have you received the Holy Spirit? So they said to him, we haven't not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. What is that, basically? We never heard of him. So he said the question that should precede the Holy Spirit, which is baptism. The baptism does not give the Holy Spirit. Baptism is required that later on you receive the Holy Spirit when you're baptized. So when, when you see a baby be getting baptized, he's not Christian yet. He's eligible for Christianity. But a person is Christian when he's a temple of the Holy Spirit. So when he receives the Merun, then the person is Christian. Baptism is removal of the old nature, the corruption, to make him eligible for the Holy Spirit to dwell in a, in a new creation, not a corrupted creation. We're going to cover this later on in the catechism. So, St. Paul made a notch backward. He don't know of the Holy Spirit, so I need to ask about baptism. Into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. They thought that's enough. St. Paul answers from John's statement. Which John, by the way? Which John? When, he says in, when they said in John's baptism, which John? Who's John who was baptizing? John Baptist. Yay, that's correct. <laughs> we had to say it. <laughs> it's not John the Evangelist. Well, of course, John the Evangelist can baptize. Uh, but the baptism of St. John would be true baptism because he's an apostle. So they didn't get baptized in Christ. They got baptized by the baptism of John, but they believed in Christ. Then St. Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance. This term he uses in one of his sermons in chapter 13 in Acts. Uh, sorry, yet yeah, chapter 13. Saying to the people that this saying, so St. John is saying, so St. Paul is not inserting himself. John himself said, St. John the Baptist himself said, the people should believe, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would, who would come after him, that is Christ Jesus. You did this part correctly. But there is baptism in, in Christ Jesus, it's not baptism in John. When they heard this, they were baptized at sacrament number one in the name of the Lord Christ. Can they have communion now? No, not yet. They have to be temples for the Holy Spirit. The whole idea of salvation is for man to become a temple for the Holy Spirit again. So St. Paul is asking about this. When you believed, did you become temples for the Holy Spirit? You didn't hear, hear of him. So he's asking, checking out, not their faith, checking out where, who, whether they were baptized or not. So he baptized them. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the, the Holy Spirit came upon them. So right in verse 6, Acts 19, 6, only an apostle can give the Holy Spirit by the laying of hand. So St. Paul had to become an apostle. In other words, the bishop. And that happens in 13. So in Acts 9, he believed. He's still just normal Christian. In Acts 13, the Holy Spirit said, I need these two. 
So they laid their hands on them. That's a different laying of hands. So you see the same, they laid hands on them, that's the same four words. But then it's for ordination here, that's to give the Holy Spirit. Who knows the difference? The Holy Spirit himself. And to show that the Holy Spirit comes into a person in the early church, the person has supernatural powers, speaking in tongues or prophesying or teaching. Prophesying also is used in, in teaching. Okay. So, the New Testament is very concise because the practice is already done. And who leads the practice? The Holy Spirit. You must be reading the practice. And it got documented in the form of few sentences. It doesn't need a text for the liturgy because that will be adjusted with time by the Holy Spirit based on the need of the church. So show us the shadow, the point we're on, show us, the Old Testament shows us the shadow of the real things. The real is the New Testament, salvation through the Messiah associated with the worship. You can have here a new worship that's in the Holy Spirit. While the shadow is the absence of the Messiah and worshiping God via worship that does not lead to the cleansing of the conscience. So the shadow has worship, that's the Old Testament. We apply the commandments of the Old Testament, but now we don't apply the way the Old Testament worship was happening because it's void of any work of the Holy Spirit. God doesn't exist in it at all. It's all rituals that God put, but he's not in it because it's earthly. Then he will replace it by a worship that's his part of. That's the Trinitarian worship that we have in all of our prayers. That's why we also always say, Glory be to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Old Testament is crucial because it shows that God wants a congregation. So, in the Old Testament, the advantage of it is that God wants a group of people, a congregation that knows about holiness, avoids sins, listens to commandments, follows a certain detailed worship. They're familiar with worship and a house of God and so on as a, as a way to approach Him. Gentiles didn't have anything like that. And that created a clash in the New Testament, where the Jews have a background and the Gentiles are coming into the worship of the New Testament directly, which is what God intended, in fact. But this different backgrounds created collision. We will not dis discuss it much because it's in, in mainly in Romans and Galatians, so we'll, we'll leave it for now. Last point, last point, which is used a lot in... Um, how to decipher between what's right and wrong. Any land that we're supposed to live in should be holy. Um, Leviticus um, 18 talks about this, and Proverbs uh, 14, 34, righteousness exalts a nation, and the reproach of people is sin. So um, God is asking us, wherever we are, to keep the area we're in holy. Literally, there was a land that's holy, that's the promised land, and God focused on that land to, to stay holy. And that's why he cleaned the land from the Gentiles that were living in it, Old Testament, from the seven nations, I hope I can get them right, the Canaanites, the Gergesites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and Amorites, and the seventh one, can't remember. So these seven nations were occupying the land, and then the people coming from Exodus, the land was now lost by from the Jews. And when Joseph was sold, he brought Jacob and the, and the tribes. So they grew in Egypt. Now the exodus is happening going back to this land. But the, by that time, that land is horrible. And the, the people occupying it are very sinful. So God will clean the land from the sin by Joshua cleaning the land, by Joshua overcoming all of these seven nations. And then the land gets assigned to the tribes. That's the book of Joshua. How the, Israel came back to the land and they have certain... Each tribe has his own land. Now the land is holy till things will happen and trash will come back in. So all of this is a valuable thing that the, that the New Testament didn't come out of vacuum. There is concept of a congregation. There is concept of house of God. There is a concept of a location you live in that must be holy. In this case, now it's you in the Old Testament because in the New Testament, because you are that land. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But the concept of keeping wherever I live holy is very easy for the Christians to understand, especially the Jews who come from, into Christianity. That's why the Jewish Christian is much more deeper, is much deeper than the Gentile Christian. 
because of their understanding. Because they didn't come out of vacuum. Gentiles came out of vacuum. It was required for them only to believe in Christ, avoid sexual immorality, avoid eating anything um, uh, strangled, avoid eating anything with blood. That's where the commandments for the Gentiles don't burden them with the stuff in the Old Testament that is now removed. So they have to observe the basic Christian things which the Jews already observe. Okay, let's um, now go to chapter 1 to read it quickly and then we'll go to chapter 2 of Hebrews. You can uh, open your Bibles because... The sample will start comparing Christ to the, to the angels first in chapter 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, the two worlds, not multiple worlds, two worlds means the visible and the invisible. In, in the book, in the St. Basil literature, we say, by whom he created the visible and the invisible. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sin, this is Christ. So, so we are privileged because in the Old Testament, God spoke to us in multiple ways. In the New Testament, he spoke to us by his only begotten son. So he's telling the Jews we're so much better in Christ that whatever glory we had in the Old Testament. When he had by self purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than angels. Why do we compare Christ to angels? Because the Jews had very glorified position for angels, that by them the commandments were given from God to Moses by angels on the 50th day, which is the harvest or the Pentecost. So receiving the Ten Commandments happened in the tradition of the Jews on the Pentecost by angels handing them over. As he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. No angel has the name of Christ. We will start comparing here. Just in case you're wondering why angels. Because angels were the communication between God and man in the Old Testament. As, as uh, Jacob in chapter 28 of Genesis, he saw angels coming up and down on a ladder where God is on top. Jacob's head is in the bottom on a certain stone. He anointed that stone later on and called it house of God, Bethel. And what's going up the ladder and down are angels. God is not communicating in his person to the people. So now St. Paul, by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, compares that Christ is higher than any angel. So I say, whom did God tell as an angel, you are my son, today I have begotten you? No angel received this statement. Verse 5. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. None of the angels got this, these words. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, again more about Christ, let all the angels of God worship him. So definitely Christ is higher than the angels, because all of the angels must worship him. But, but of the angels, this is something different. Who makes his angels spirits, and his ministers servants. So the angels are servants, a flame of fire. So, there is a certain verse, if you want to know this, verse 5 with the two statements. Verse 6 are about Christ, higher than the angels. Verse 7 is the comparison that the angels are ministers. Christ is not a minister. He came as a servant, as humility, but Christ is God. And then he, he catches himself again. But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. No angel has thrown forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved, you have loved excuse me, righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God your God, God the Father, has anointed you. Anointment happened in front of our eyes on the Feast of Epiphany. That's why Christ had to start his ministry by being anointed. But a human, like St. John the Baptist, cannot anoint God. So who anointed God? The Holy Spirit. That's in the epiphany. We see a dove alighting on Christ. So that visually, Christ applied his own system to himself. Everybody who will come from me must be anointed. 
God as a messenger coming, he also gets anointed. But he doesn't get anointed by human. He gets anointed by the Holy Spirit. And that's in Arabic very clear. The word Christ doesn't give the meaning, but el Masih. El Masih literally means the anointed. Yeshua al Masih. If, uh, if you want to take notes for this, this happened in... Um, he anointed me to preach to the captive in Luke chapter 4, where he's quoting Isaiah chapter 61. The, that the, that, sorry, the Lord has anointed me to proclaim to the captive liberation. That's a fulfillment of St. Luke is writing that verse to say that it got fulfilled because Christ said this verse is fulfilled today. When he read that in the, in the synagogue, he said this verse was fulfilled today because it talks about him. Of course, he didn't have a good day after this. And again about Christ, your Lord in the beginning, you Lord, sorry, you Lord means you Christ in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. The creation happened by the Holy Trinity. And the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they will grow old like a garment, like a cloak, you will fold them up. And they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. Everything goes old except Christ, except God. But we're focusing on Christ because this is the visible prophet that he crucified. And St. Paul was so happy to kill anybody who preaches him. So the focus of um, Hebrews is, is, is about Christ. Because it's the final and the climax way of God talking to people. That he comes in the form of people. Talk about relating to somebody. Like you become him. God is relating to us that he becomes a person. So we can never feel he doesn't feel what I'm going through, he doesn't feel the pain, he doesn't feel hunger, he, doesn't, he felt it all because he took our nature. But to which of the angels, so finally he, he, he finalized by this, to which of the angels he ever said, sit at my right hand till, till I make your enemies footstool, your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits? They are servants. Angels are servants sent forth to minister, to serve diaconos. Diaconus is in Ephesians 3, 7. This is about humans. To, to minister for those who will inherit salvation. St. Paul now, as a summary of chapter 1, we are so blessed that God is speaking to us himself, not in the form he spoke to our fathers, he's speaking to us himself in, the, in his visible image, and that's the Son, because the Father has not seen by anybody the, the only begotten Son in the bosom of the Father he came and foretold, or he came and explained. They did this last week, so let's get now to our agenda tonight, which is chapter 2. Um, Caroline, do you like to read for us? We'll read till, maybe you can stop at, at uh, the book study Bible at 11. Sorry, 9, 9, including 9. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. For he has not put the world to come, of which we speak, in subjection to angels." But one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Wow. Okay. First part, which is these, these four verses. Therefore, so 
as I have laid the foundation by two facts. We are the best, living the best times, or we are more privileged than our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Aaron, you name them, because God spoke to us in a completely different, higher way, in his only begotten son. Second, if we honor angels, he's higher than the angels. This is what we laid as chapter one, as a proof of the main two privileges about things we honor, and now there's so much little compared to what we enjoy in Christ. First one, we honor the prophets and the history and the Old Testament and how privileged we are to know God truly compared to the Gentiles. But now he's speaking to us in the form of he himself, his only begotten son. He's the express image of his glory. Second, we honor that our commandments came from heaven. Moses received them by angels. Doesn't matter angels. God is higher than angels. And this is the same God whom we see. Therefore, based on these two facts, that's why he starts with therefore, be careful not to believe in him. And as I said in chapter 10, be careful you who believe in him because of economical pressures to leave him. And they were very close to this. So St. Paul is writing the epistle to two types of Jews. The Jews that didn't believe and still holding on to their angels and the prophets and so on, telling him we're spoken to by God directly. And the Jews who believed and thinking of leaving Christianity because of the pressures they suffer in Jerusalem from persecution. And these are going to be detailed in chapter 10. So immaterial of who are the audience, these are these two, which means what, and for us as well, do not neglect a salvation of that magnitude. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed, fear, respect, obedience to the things we have heard lest we drift away from Christianity. Comparing to the punishment of the one who ignores the law in the Old Testament, our punishment will be much more because we have the real thing here. For if the word spoken through angels, that's the Old Testament, proved steadfast, God fulfilled and it's very holy and we conquered nations and the walls of Jericho fell and every, we have the really true God by far. And every transgression and disobedience received a just reward that's in the shadow of the real things while being in the Old Testament. What will happen to you if you do this in the New Testament? How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? That's a New Testament. Which at first, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, Jesus Christ, whom I hated and I was so happy to kill his followers, and was confirmed by his apostles. Those who uh, by, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. How do you know St. Paul? Well, St. Paul is a special case. He appeared to me and he told me, you're persecuting me. You can't resist me. But there's other people that receive Christianity, not from Christ directly, from the apostles. Example is Cornelius in chapter 10 of Acts. God sent to him St. Peter. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders. Yes, they cast out demons, they healed the sick. Samaria was so much believing in Christ because of the deacon, the deacon Philip, doing miracles there, and they converted and got baptized. Even the biggest sorcerer that they called Simon, or Simeon, no, no, Simon. Simon, who did miracles that they call him God in that city, he sold all his books, he burned all his books and brought them to Philip. And he believed. So there is great miracles that we have seen that proves that this is true. These are the followers of the true God. With various miracles, the old, the early Christianity must have had miracles for the people to believe in it because they had nothing to prove that God is God, Jesus is God. And gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So this is a question. If there is so much stern judgment and and stoning if we break the law of the Old Testament. How much more if we do to the New Testament? That's the question we have for them. You can't ignore this. Whether you're a Jew that haven't converted or you're a Jew that has contemplated contemplating going back and leaving Christian. Any questions so far? As I said, the main theme of Hebrews is comparison and support for the Jews to convert or for the Jews Christians to stay in it. And this is not history, this is us today. So when you find persecution, when you find you want to write a nasty email or to fight back, 
or to kill somebody like your boss, for example, <laughs> which is very com very probable <laughs> because of what they do, um, they are ignorant, they are blind, they are not knowing what they are doing. You stay um, in your face or you stay practicing your faith and that gets written in gold in heaven and nobody can touch it, no matter what their position is. So God said, I will give you joy and nobody can take away your joy, your joy from you. And if need be, for the time being, to suffer for his sake, that the genuineness of your faith might be tested with fire. So if need be, God, God is doing this not haphazardly, but he finds things in you that are good to be perfected, are good to be examples, are you going to use it to help somebody else in the future? He knows. He knows why your life gets difficult sometimes. He, he knows exactly. And all of you go through difficulty because it will make heaven door, instead of looking like this, to be looking like this for you. Nothing will make it wider, except when people make your life for you on earth tougher. God has to reward you, and the reward is eternal, and nobody can touch it. For he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels. So, God the Father has not put the world to come in subjection to angels, but he put it in subjection to his only begotten Son. This he is God the Father. I'm going to get into, I wish I had the magnets, we did the Holy Trinity for the kids in the summer camp. There is the inseparability between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So, God the Father is not going to be incarnate. God the Son became incarnate. In his incarnation, he appears weaker than angels. He's a human. People can do anything to him and, and nothing happens to him. That, that can be God. He's, he's not even defending himself. And that's the beauty of God's humility and self-control and teaching us how to manage this life. If you manage it face to face, you're going to stoop down to levels that other people stoop down to, but you cannot do it. Hopefully you cannot do it. For he has not put the world to come, God has not put the world to come, of which we speak, eternity, under angels. He hasn't. He put it under his Son. But one testifies in a certain place, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and set him over the works of your hands. Okay, this is a bit complicated. So in the creation, in the creation, Adam and Eve are not invisible spirits, so they may appear little lower than angels, but they are crowned with glory and honor. They are set to have dominion over all the creation. And everything was put under subjection under their feet till the fall happened. Who will replace Adam and Eve in this dominion? Christ. So this applies to both man before the fall and Jesus Christ who will save man after the fall. Again, what is man that you are mindful of him? Yeah, I'm mindful of Adam and Eve. I'll give them everything. Yeah, they may not be having the powers of angels or Lucifer or the dominions or the powers or the authorities, but I'm very mindful of them and will crown them with glory and honor. I put my spirit in them. That's the biggest glory and honor that one can get is that God lives inside the person. And I give them dominion over all the creation that I spent 14 billion years preparing for. And everything is under their feet. They lack nothing. You have put everything under my feet. You did not make me in need of anything of the works of your glory. I have everything in the paradise. When I fell, who will fill my place? Who will fill my place to bring me back to the honor that I had before? A human who is able to fix everything that I've done wrong. Fix my nature, because it got corrupted. Fix that I die, give me power over death. Fix my worship, and fix that eternity was lost from me. No one can do this except God, because simple reason, the Holy Trinity that did the creation is the only one that can do the salvation, not Jesus alone. The Holy Trinity that did the creation is the Holy Trinity that did the salvation. God sent his only begotten son, 
when the son died and ascended he sends the Holy Spirit there's an order to the salvation and the Holy Spirit lives in the humans after by baptism because baptism makes them rise from the dead with Christ so Christ had to come first rise from the dead he didn't save us and I'm gonna repeat this and it sound eerie to you God when he rose from the dead did not save the humans God saved the human nature every person now every human needs to take that nature that's the confusion between us and the protestant god rose from the dead he saved us we're done you don't do anything no this is the foundation but that foundation means the human nature is saved that of christ i i need to take that human nature from him what where does this happen you have to die and resurrect with him am i going to resurrect yes guaranteed because he resurrected nobody before him resurrected so in the old testament it has no meaning then when you resurrect with him that happens the nature you're coming up with from the water or if it's beheading happened and you're ready the new nature goes to the kingdom of heaven this new nature is eligible that the holy spirit can live in again in this condition you can go and have communion because communion is the whole goal of god that you're not you're not separate from him so this is a magnificent passage because it applies to me before the fall and it applies to Christ how he sold to bring me back again after the fall. It has nothing to do with angels. The Holy Trinity who created me, no, it didn't have flesh. There was no need, there's no salvation. There's no problem to be solved. The creation does not need salvation or doesn't make any sense. When the fall happened, the same Holy Trinity did the salvation. How? The Son took flesh. Why the Father did it, why the Holy Spirit did it, this is the nature of the human tree. This is the role of every God in the Holy Trinity. But it's one essence, one nature, one God. Any question on this part? You see now the vast.